there are some experiments that were done in the early 20th century in which under certain conditions it looked as though maybe organic material could be created from non-organic material, but there really, as you point out, has not been a great explanation of how non-organic material could create an information system like DNA. I was wondering if right, you could elucidate right. that. So yeah, the famous experiment still in a lot of the biology textbooks uh, is the Miller-Urey experiment of 1952, 1953. Um, they uh, sparked a, a, a chamber that had gases known as reducing gases that uh, then spontaneously produced a few of the 20 protein forming amino acids, two or three. Um, the problem is that amino acids do not a protein make and proteins by themselves do not make life. So they were really quite a long ways away from demonstrating anything like a spontaneous chemical origin of life. Um, it's ironic that that experiment was performed in the same year as Watson and Crick's discovery of the uh, structure of the DNA molecule and the subsequent elucidation of the information bearing properties of the molecule. Because in what's called chemical evolutionary theory, by the 1960s and certainly by the early 1980s, uh, the field reached a state of impasse precisely because the biologists and the, and the biochemists realized that to build an actual living cell, you've got to have information-rich molecules. You can't just have the components. You can't just have the letters. You've got to have the sentences. And, uh, and so, uh, there were a number of problems with the Miller-Urey experiment. One was they presupposed conditions on the early Earth and in the early Earth's atmosphere that didn't actually match the conditions on the early Earth. We didn't have an early, a, a reducing atmosphere. We had a slightly oxidizing or neutral atmosphere. You rerun those experiments, you don't get amino acids forming spontaneously. But the bigger problem was how do you arrange the amino acids in, in the very specific ways that are required to form a three-dimensional structure called a, 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 a protein fold? And that problem hasn't been solved apart from watching DNA do it inside living cells. So to build proteins, what we know is you need information stored in the DNA molecule. And so as, as the molecular biological revolution unfolded in, this, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, people, the, the scientists working on the origin of life realized the problem was much harder than they realized because they didn't just need to account for certain kinds of building blocks of life. They needed to account for the information that would organize the building blocks into DNA molecules, into protein molecules, and into the complex information processing systems that characterize even the simplest living cells. So one of the theories that has been posited to sort of solve this problem is the so-called RNA world thesis. Can you talk about what yeah, exactly yeah. that is? So um, one of the reasons the origin of life problem is so hard for evolutionary biologists is you can't invoke natural selection reasonably. Uh, because natural selection only it, you know, that's, uh, depends on self-replication, differential survival of lots of uh, or, uh, uh, offspring, okay? But that only happens, differential um, uh, or, organisms only divide and, and reproduce on the basis of things that are happening at a molecular level that involve information-rich DNA and proteins. So if you're trying to explain the origin of information-rich DNA and proteins, you can't invoke prebiotic natural selection. It's a contradiction in terms, as one of the great evolutionary biologists, Dobzhansky, said. So that made the origin of life problem even harder than the problems we've been talking about previously as far as explaining the origin of the information for new forms of life. But one theory that attempted to get around that is called the RNA world. And it was, it was based on the observation that some RNA molecules can generate, can form, perform two functions at once. They can perform the function of information storage, like DNA, but they can also catalyze certain reactions, uh, like proteins. Proteins catalyze at much faster rates than would otherwise occur really crucial biochemical reactions that are crucial to metabolism. So if RNA could do both, the thought was, then maybe life started with an RNA molecule that could copy itself, that could get natural selection going at a molecular level before you had life. Problem has turned out again to be an information problem. So we've done experiments on RNA, it's turned out that um, We've, people have, they call them ribozyme engineering experiments. And the, the, the name is apt because it is a lot of intelligent design. It's a lot of engineering. But people have tried to engineer RNA molecules by arranging the sequence of bases. RNA, like DNA, has these, these bases that carry information. And they've arranged the bases very specifically to try to build RNA molecules that would copy themselves to get a self-replicating system going, which would get natural selection going. Problem is, number one, we have been able to design some RNA molecules that will copy about 10% of themselves, but only if the bases are very specifically arranged, which means that to get a self-replicating system going, you got to have information. And where is the information coming from? It's coming from the intelligent biochemist who's doing the ribozyme engineering. 
So what's actually being simulated in these simulations is the need, we argue, for intelligent design. The RNA world doesn't eliminate or doesn't refute the, the intelligent design argument based on information. It actually demonstrates or illustrates the need for intelligent design. And so I don't think it really solves the problem of, uh, unless RNA world people are saying, well, that's where the intelligent designer input the information in the first place. Okay, so it seems like the, the biggest blowback that you've gotten, obviously, in terms of intelligent design is the term intelligent design, because it seems like most of the critiques that you've made of neo-Darwinism are fairly well accepted. Is that, is that accurate? In, increasingly so. In 2016, a number of us went attended a conference at the Royal Society of London in, uh, uh, obviously, London, and it was a group of leading evolutionary biologists called the meeting to uh, address new trends in evolutionary biology, they called it. It was an innocuous way of saying neo-Darwinism is dead and we need a new theory. The first talk of the conference was by a leading Austrian evolutionary biologist named Gerd Müller, who uh, enumerated five, what he called, explanatory deficits of neo-Darwinism. Elsewhere, he's uh, written that neo-Darwinism has no theory of the generative, by which he means it explains the small-scale variations very well, like the Galapagos finches, but it doesn't explain the origin of major innovations in the history of life. And so many evolutionary biologists are now, there, there's an aphorism that's afoot. It's uh, uh, mutation and selection explain the survival, but not the arrival of the fittest. The problem is the, the, the main mechanism of evolutionary change doesn't seem to have significant creative power. And that's the problem I think increasingly being recognized. And as a result of that, many people within evolutionary biology are looking for new mechanisms, calling for the formulation of a new theory. And that's kind of, that's kind of striking. It's an astounding admission. When you think about how the theory is presented through the textbooks, through with science popularizers, the new atheists, um, the, the, the public spokesman for science, the National Center for Science Education, or the, the National Academy of Sciences. When they talk about evolution, it's a, it's a fact. Richard Dawkins has said that if you, if you find someone who questions it, they're either stupid, wicked, or insane. Um, it, but the reality on the ground, or rather in the peer-reviewed literature within evolutionary biology is very different. There's a recognition that the fundamental problems haven't been solved. And one of which is, uh, Mueller acknowledged the problem of the origin of biological form. When I saw that, it was, it's, in a, it's in a table in, in, a, in a book that he's written with another evolutionary biologist, is a list of unsolved problems, one of which they list the origin of biological form. I was stunned. That's 2003, MIT Press. That was the very problem that Darwin was supposed to have solved in 1859, and it's now an open question. Well, with, with that said, it seems like for, for a lot of folks like Dawkins, it's not about the God of the gaps, it's about the Darwinism of the gaps. The idea that eventually we're going to figure out that Darwinism still holds in these circumstances where it appears not to hold. Is that accurate, or does he have a theory for how to fix it? Well, there, there's a, yeah, there's a very good explanation for that in the sociology and philosophy of science. Uh, the assumption is we have to have a materialistic explanation. We can't allow creative intelligence or agency or mind to, we can't posit that as, as part of the explanation for how life got here. And there's a rule that many scientists take as normative. It's called methodological naturalism. And it says, if you're going to be a scientist, you have to explain everything by reference to purely undirected material processes. And if you deviate from that in any way, you're not being scientific. That's why I got called a pseudoscientist on the, uh, the Wikipedia webpage. It was a little bit of an upgrade because previously they had me down as a theologian and I have no, no, no training in theology. But, um, in any case, this methodological rule is actually only as recent as the late 19th century in science. The founders of modern science, Newton, Boyle, Kepler, they didn't adhere to this at all. They saw design in science, in, in, well, in the, in the natural world, and they wrote about it in their science, uh, in their, in their science treaties. Um, for example, in the General Scolium to the Principia, the, the, Newton's great work on gravitation, he's got a terrific argument for design based on the fine-tuning of the planetary orbits. Um, so design arguments were part of science from its foundation, but they, be, they became verboten in the late 19th century after the, the, the origin of species. And th there's a very curious thing about this rule of methodological naturalism. Uh, if, you're, if you're investigating an origin question or a causal origins question, it's a rule that actually limits the intellectual freedom of the scientist. There's a lot of, a lot of areas of science where methodological naturalism is innocuous. But if you're asking the question, what caused life or the information necessary to produce life to arise. And you, re you recognize that it could be an undirected material process, or it might have been a mind, but then you decide in advance that you're not going to consider any evidence of mind. Of course, you're only going to get materialistic explanations, but the explanations may not be adequate. I mean, imagine you go into the, uh, 
the, the British Museum, you look at the Rosetta Stone, you see all those inscriptions in three different languages, and you say, well, uh, I'd like to say it was a scribe, but since I adhere to methodological naturalism, I've got to say it was wind and erosion or something like that. It, the, the, the rule actually limits scientists from following the evidence where it most naturally leads. Information, based on our knowledge of cause and effect, is a strong indicator of the activity of intelligence. And yet we can't say that or consider that if we accept methodological naturalism. And that's what's going on. That's why the, the dialectic kind of goes in circles where you'll get a new evolutionary model every few years, and then they circle back to the one that was rejected you know, 20, 20 years ago and start the cycle all over again. Because we're really looking in the wrong place. We're barking up the wrong tree. I mean, it does raise the question, if you're a methodological naturalist and all you believe is that undirected processes are responsible for everything, why you believe in such a thing as objective truth, for example, because... Or, or if, the reliability of the human mind, as we were discussing before the interview. Right, you know? I mean, yeah. if the idea is that the human mind is capable of grasping the world around it, and there is such a thing as objective truth that we can grasp, then that would suggest that our mind reflects the universe in some deep, profound way, as opposed to the sort of evolutionary biology belief, which is that we are just adaptable balls of meat. And so whatever we think about the universe, maybe it's helpful in terms of our adaptation, but it's not necessarily true. That's very well put. This was the, the very thing that bothered Thomas Nagel, the great philosopher of science from NYU. Um, Nagel got himself into a bit of trouble. He wrote a, a favorable review of uh, Signature in the Cell in the Times Literary Supplement. And then there was a huge blowback, including from a lot of other fellow atheists. Nagel's an atheist. Um, but Nagel uh, accepted the, the, the critical arguments in Signature in the Cell and began to get more critical of Darwinism as well, not just chemical evolutionary theory, but biological evolutionary theory. And in 2012, he doubled down by publishing his own book with Oxford Press called Mind and Cosmos, How the Neo-Darwinian Materialist View of Reality is Almost Certainly False, was the subtitle. And his problem was the one that you just articulated, that clearly we live in a universe in which mind is a reality. And if neo-Darwinism can't account for that, then it's missing something really big. So it, 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 it's, a, it's an inadequate explanation for uh, something we observe all the time, which is the activity of minds. I see it in our conversation. I know I have a mind by my own introspective experience. This is a part of reality too. And if, if, the, if evolution can't account for that, and if we exclude mind as an explanatory principle, we're gonna have an impoverished, understanding of the world around us. And so I think this is a very, a very important aspect of the debate is, rel uh, is recognizing that mind is a reality. Well, th th this actually is, is one of the fascinating sort of theories that, that Dawkins puts forth is essentially that mind is a spandrel, that, mm -hmm. that mind is, is just something that we feel like we have, but it actually does not exist in the first place, which does raise the question as to why he does what he does for a living. I mean, if you're in the business of explanation, why bother operating along the spandrels? It's extremely self-defeating. You're absolutely right. But it's interesting that the, the neo-Darwinists say that design in life is an illusion. We have apparent design, but not real design. It's first line from the blind watchmaker, page one. Biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. But in the at the end of the day, Dawkins also has to say that mind itself, purposive intelligence, is also an illusion. That's an impoverished worldview. We all know better than that.